this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blowed his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling it. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me just get a hold of me. And if you want more shows every week, every Thursday we release a bonus show just like you hear on Tuesdays, only it's on Thursdays for the members to the website. So if you're interested in having extra shows every week, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button and become a member today. Now this week we have a great show planned for you. We have Wendy coming on the show and Wendy's going to share her paranormal experiences that she's had throughout her life. But her life is a little different in the sense that she's seen a lot of different things when it comes to the paranormal. She saw these things come into her room, what they did to her. You're just going to have to listen because it's something that I can't even describe. But then she's also going to be talking about how she was married to a man. And shortly after they got married, he threatened her life in a very, very serious way. And quite frankly, I'm very surprised that she's still alive today. And she comes on the show to share these experiences with us today. But before we get into that, I want to let you guys know on Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we are going live for the members on the members website. I've been doing a lot of extra live content for the members. And this Friday, I'm very excited to announce that we have a special guest coming on the show, Dr. Paul Cottrell. And Dr. Paul Cottrell is going to be coming on the show to talk about the coronavirus and his findings with with this disease. He is actually based out of New York City, which is the hot zone for the coronavirus in the United States. And he's been looking at this for just about as long as I have. And he's found some very incredible things that leads him to believe that this is more than likely a bioweapon. He's going to come on the confessionals to talk all about it. But before we get into Wendy, I want you to hear a little sample of what Dr. Paul Cottrell talks about and what he'll be talking about this Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Professionals members website. Let's go. All right, today we got a great guest coming on. We have Wendy. Wendy, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself, Tony? I'm doing fine. So uh, we were just sitting here talking a little bit, and it turns out you found the show through uh, Sam's show, Tinfoil Hat Podcast. So shout out to that podcast uh, for uh, helping you find us. That's really cool. Um, so you have a, a life of experiences, and some of them are kind of like a little bit all over, but they might have linkage 
And we want to just start off from when you were a kid. Now, I know when you were a kid, you had saw a shadow figure. Uh, I think it was downstairs and then it had pushed you or something had pushed you down the steps. So why don't you start us off there? Because I think that's where it kind of all started for you. And just share with us some of these experiences that you've had throughout your life. Okay. Um, so that experience happened, I think, when I was about four or five. Um, my mom and grandma were on a business trip uh, to Kansas City. And we were staying with my grandpa in their old farmhouse. And um, I was sleeping with, upstairs with my two sisters. Um, and I remember going to bed that night. And I was excited because I knew my mom was going to be home later that afternoon. And I remember waking up and it was pitch black in the house. And um, I hear my grandma's voice calling my name. And so I get up and I try to wake my sisters up because, you know, hey, if grandma's home, then mom's home. And I remember trying really hard to wake them up. And for some reason, they wouldn't wake up. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to go see mom by myself then. (laughs) And, um... So I go out of the bedroom and I go to the landing of the stairs and um, the way the staircase was, you go down a flight, there's a landing and it turns 90 degrees and you go, you know, down to the ground floor. And um, I remember standing at the top of the stairs and I could see uh, at the bottom of the stairs, there's this dark shadow and I hear it, you know, calling my name. And it sounds just like my grandma. And, you know, in my little child's mind, um, things aren't adding up, but I don't know exactly what's going on. Um, So I decide, okay, well, I'm just going to go down the stairs and, you know, see my mom and grandma. As I go to take a step down the stairs, um, I see this shadow out of the left, off my left hand side, at the corner of my eye. And the next thing I know, I feel this hand on my back. And I remember going down the stairs. Um, and the next thing I know, I don't know how long it was, but I wake up at on the landing of the stairs. And it's still dark. And, you know, I don't hear anything. And I get up and I look around and, you know, I'm trying to find my mom and trying to find my grandma. And I don't know what's going on. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll just go back up the stairs and go to bed. So I go back up the stairs and my sisters are still asleep and um, I go to lay down and I remember feeling this hand uh, on my back and I turn around and I look and nobody's there, but I just get this really bad feeling. And, you know, as a kid, you don't really understand, you know, the whole spiritual aspect of stuff. Um, So I just kind of brushed it off and I went back to sleep. Um, And, you know, the next day my, my mom comes home and that was really the first experience that I ever had. Um, So growing up uh, for the next couple of years, I was terrified to go to sleep at night. Um, I didn't know what it was. Um, I couldn't really explain it to my mom, um, but I just, I guess, had this sense of impending doom uh, every night when I would go to sleep. I guess I was afraid to wake up at night. Um, So this goes on for most of my life um, until I'm about 10 years old. Uh, And then when we were 10 years old, when I was 10 years old, (laughs) we moved down to the town we live in now. And, uh, which was about 70 miles away from where I grew up. Um, and this property was out in the middle of nowhere, out in the woods. Our closest mile, our our closest neighbor was about a mile away. Wow. And, um, yeah. (laughs) And it's just straight up deep woods, big, huge trees. Um, yeah. And my dad, he was a hound hound hunter um he had very well-trained dogs that uh we go hunt bear and cougar with and so that's one reason why he wanted to be out you know in the woods um and i was really excited because i was hoping that you know things would change for me not that i'd had any experiences really since 
that first one. Um, but just the overall feeling, I was just kind of hoping for a fresh start, I guess. And things were okay for a little bit. Um, and I remember one night, uh, just waking up, not really knowing why. And, um, I'm laying there and I could just feel like something's wrong. I think I was about maybe 13 at the time. And I'm just laying there trying to figure out what is going on. And like in my mind's eye, I guess you could say, I see this uh, dark figure in the corner of my room. And, you know, I knew about angels and demons and, you know, stuff like that. But I guess I'd never connected, you know, what I experienced when I was younger to any of that at that time. Um, so, uh, sorry, this is really hard for me. <laughs> That's all right. Um, Take your time. Um, I go and I open my eyes, really, really hoping that this thing is not there. And it was, and, um, you know, I was terrified. And so, you know, I started screaming, which at the time I was sleeping with my, uh, my younger sister, we shared a room. And of course, you know, me waking up in the middle of the night screaming scared her. So she started screaming and my parents came in and, you know, what's wrong? And I told them, you know, Oh, I saw, you know, I saw a shadow figure and, um, my dad kind of brushed it off. Um, and my mom, she said, you know, it's okay. We'll just pray and everything will be fine. Um, well, I saw that thing every night in my room for a very long time. Um, each night it would be in a different place. I would wake up and I would just be paralyzed with fear. Um, and I knew it was there, you know, that just cold fear in the pit of your stomach um and every night it would be in a different spot like one night it would be you know in the right in front of the closet or I could feel it was in the closet or in front of the window um I remember one night it really it really scared me it was on the ceiling up in the corner of my room and it was up there facing towards me um and, but its hands and its feet were turned backwards, you know, kind of like Spider-Man on the ceiling. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, it was, it was really trippy and it never said anything, but I could just, in my mind, hear it taunting me, just laughing, not even really saying anything, but just that sense of enjoyment um, out of my fear. And, um, that went on for a really, really long time every single night. Um, and then it slowly kind of tapered off uh, and it wouldn't be every night. It'd be every other night. Um, can I ask you and a then question? it turned into a couple times a week. Yeah, go ahead. Let me ask you a question real quick. Cause I know I'm going to forget to, uh, ask this later. Um, a little bit of details about this thing that you saw in the ceiling corner of the, of the room. Uh, obviously the hands and feet being turned backwards is, is it's a frightening image to even think about, let alone experience. Uh, did this thing looking at you, did it smile at you at all? Like you, you said that it seemed like it had taken joy in your fear. Uh, did it, did it smile at you? Because we hear uh, on this show a lot, and I know you're a relatively new listener, so you may not have heard, uh, such shows, but we hear these entities appearing, um, and uh, quite a few times now, I remember hearing people say it was like uh, in the ceiling corner of the room and it looked at them and it smiled at them. Uh, and the smile went from like ear to ear. It was just like a huge smile. Sometimes they describe it as a jagged teeth. Did you see anything like that? Um, not with this situation. Um, this, this thing was just pure solid black and it was darker than the darkness is the only way I can explain that. Okay. But there was no facial features. It was in the shape of a man, um, but I never saw any facial features or, you know, anything like that. 
Okay. Um, but um, one of my experiences, I do have <laughs> that type of thing. We'll, we'll make sure we hit on it then. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so these things slowly uh, tapered off. Um, and then I think it was at least a month or two where I had this reprieve. I I could feel it but I didn't see it. And at that point I had been so tormented. It was, even though I could sense it being there, I, it was, it was better than me seeing it. Um, cause I, I, there was a different level of fear of, you know, okay, I, I can feel something in the room with me versus seeing something in the room with me, you know? Um, so one night I go to bed and um, and you know, through this whole time, I just pray every single night before I go to get bed, you know, God, please, you know, keep me safe, keep this thing away from me. Um, and even though I prayed, you know, every single night, this thing still appeared and it was like, okay, what's going on here? What did, <laughs> what did I do? Did I do something wrong? You know, um, why isn't God protecting me from this thing, you know? Um, and so it tapered off and, um, I remember going to bed, um, and I wake up and I just am paralyzed. I can't move. Um, and I feel like I can't breathe. It's like a suffocating feeling. And I opened my eyes and at this point in time, my sister and I had gotten a bunk bed and, um, you know, my parents gave me a choice being the older sister. Do you want the top or the bottom? And they expected me to pick the top bunk bed. Cause you know, what kid doesn't want to be on the top bunk bed. <laughs> and, um, I picked the bottom bunk bed because I felt more safe, uh, from this thing, you know, maybe having the top bunk bed there I wouldn't be able to see the ceiling I wouldn't be able to see it on the ceiling you know type of thing and um so I'm laying there and I open my eyes and this thing is directly above me uh is back against the top of the bunk bed which there's not a whole lot of room between you know the top bed and the bottom bed yeah and I just remember feeling like this hot, putrid breath. And I just started screaming like I'd never screamed before. It was some of the worst fear I'd ever experienced in my life. Um, and it was actually so bad. And by this point, my parents had gotten used to me waking up in the middle of the night screaming. And, you know, at this point, half the time, you know, they wouldn't even come down to see what was wrong anymore. Um, but this time it was so bad that my dad actually came running down the hallway <laughs> naked with his gun in his hand because he thought someone had crawled in the window or something. Jeez. And, um, I, yeah, it, it was pretty bad. Um, and after I'd calmed down and I could tell him what was going on, um, he, I could tell he was frustrated. You know, he's like, you know, I don't know what's going on with my daughter. You know, this thing keeps happening to her. Um, and it seems like it's getting worse. Um, and it seems like after that experience, um, things kind of tapered off again. Um, and I could always feel it there. Um, honestly, even to this day, I, I could feel it, but it hasn't done anything like that for a really long time. Um, so, um, I don't know if you wanted to go into my Bigfoot experience or not, but, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I think it was Bigfoot anyways. Um, so I'm about 15 years old, maybe 16. And uh, my great grandma comes to live with us. And she had gotten dementia and couldn't live alone anymore. And um, she used to go on really long walks, you know, when she lived alone. So we tried to keep that up with her. And we had this old logging road. Um on our property and it was, it was, wasn't too steep. So it was a fairly easy walk. And every day that the uh, weather was good, we would go out and, you know, take grandma for a walk. Um, 
and we would take one of my dad's dogs. Uh, you know, they're <clears throat> she was trained in, you know, hunting bear and cougar, and they were fierce protectors. So my dad wanted us to take the dogs. Um, so I remember we took uh, one of my dad's dogs. His name was Hawkeye. And uh, we'd been walking 15, maybe 20 minutes. Same route we took every single day. And all of a sudden, all the hair on my arms stand up and I get this really weird feeling. I'm like, huh, that's strange. And at the same time, the dog started acting really weird. He, uh, all of his hackles went up and he made this growling, whimpering sound, which I'd never heard this dog do before. Uh, I mean, this dog is faced off bear and cougar. He's not afraid of anything, you know. And um, he starts sniffing the air. And about that time, the smell hits me. And I've never smelled this smell ever in my life. It was this mixture of wet dog and skunk and garbage and rotten meat and body odor just all wrapped into one. And it it was thick in the air, if that makes any sense. It was just heavy. And the dog starts looking up the hill towards our uh, our right at the time because we're going up the hill. And um, the, br- the brush is pretty thick up there. And you can see for a little ways, but once you get further into the trees, there's a lot of undergrowth with the big trees. Um, and I can kind of see something back there. But I I can't identify what it is. I can just see movement in the brush, if that makes sense. And um, and I'm getting really concerned because if it was a bear, he would be barking and acting like it was a bear. And the figure that I could see looked bigger than what a man should be. And the smell, you know, I was concerned. I've never smelled that smell ever. So... <clears throat> I told grandma, I was like, okay, grandma, let's, you know, let's go home. Cause she's kind of oblivious to what's going on at this point. Um, and we always had this stump that we would walk to. That would be our little marker. And, you know, she would see the stump and okay, well we made it. Let's turn back and go home. And, um, she thought, well, we haven't made it to the stump yet. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, grandma, well, I have to go to the bathroom. You know, because I didn't want to scare her. Um, and so she's like, oh, okay, I guess we'll go. And I said, we'll take an extra long walk tomorrow. <laughs> you know, let's just go. And so we turned around and um, I was wanting to run out of there because uh, I was so scared. Um, but grandma couldn't walk very fast. So I'm worried about what's up in the brush that I know shouldn't be there. <laughs> and us getting home and grandma can't walk very fast. (laughs) Um, So we start walking back and um, the whole time the dog, his hackles are up and he's just on point. Like you can tell he's ready. If anything happens, you know, he's going to protect us, but he's not going to go in those woods (laughs) if he doesn't have to. And, um, he's watching the hill all the way up as we go and the smell follows us and I can hear in the brush something paralleling us as we're going down the road. You know, and I've lived here most of my life, you know, we've never had an experience like this before. You know, we've seen bear on the property and, you know, but nothing, nothing like this. And, um, it follows us all the way back to the house and, um, I, you know, I get grandma in the house and I go and I put the dog away and uh, we had five dogs at the time and all of the other dogs are just kind of whining and they're anxious, kind of, you know, trotting around in their pens, sniffing the air. Like you can definitely tell they, they know something's up too. And, um, I go back in the house and mom was like, oh, you guys are back early. I'm like, oh yeah, I had to pee. (laughs) And, um. I never told my parents um, what happened that afternoon because I didn't think they would believe me, for one. You know, I'd never actually 
saw anything. You know, I saw something moving in the, you know, in the brush. And I knew my parents would just say, oh, you have an overactive imagination and whatever. So later that night, um, and we lived in an old double wide up there. Um, later that night, um, I had my bedroom window open um, for fresh air. And I remember waking up, and I don't know what time it was. Um, and I wake up to this smell that I had smelled earlier that day. And I'm laying in bed. And I can hear something walking up our driveway and our driveway came up and it went along the side of the trailer back to, um, where my dad's shop was and the dogs were. And, um, I hear something and it's walking on two feet. It wasn't four feet. It was two feet and it sounded heavy. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and it walks up the driveway and it stopped at my window and I can hear uh, it kind of huffing and like smelling if that, I don't know how to describe it, but, um, and I know it's right outside my window and I was just too scared to look and I, I'm kind of kicking myself now. <laughs> I wish I would have looked, but maybe it's glad it's, maybe it's a good thing I didn't, but, um, and it stands outside my window for a few seconds and then the dogs start going off and, you know, they're barking and whining and doing the same thing that they had done earlier that day, which, you know, if a bear's there, they are ferocious and just, you know, barking their heads off. And this was just different. And I remember as soon as the dogs started going off, this thing made like <laughs> kind of like a snort of annoyance, I guess this is the only way I can describe it. And I, I can hear it turn and walk back down the driveway. And as soon as the footsteps, I can't hear the footsteps anymore. Um, I see my parents light turn on and uh, you know, my dad goes out to check out what's going on. Um, and then the dogs calm down and, that was it. You know, nothing like that had ever happened before and it hasn't happened since. Um, so I guess I never saw Bigfoot, but <laughs> I don't know what else it would be. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, okay. So, I mean, what you described is things that people, a lot of people who have actually seen the creature describe as the environment around them before they have a sighting. And so, uh, Chances are, and especially being in, the, I don't, I don't think you said it on the recording here, but I know where you live. Uh, there, there's a good chance that there's something going on there, uh, especially since it seems like it followed you back to the house. And I mean, I'm assuming that's what you think too. It, it seems like it kind of yes. followed you. Yes, I, I do believe that it followed me. Um, yeah. Why do you think that is now? I mean, if these things are so elusive and resistant to being seen by people, uh, and this is a common question that I often think about and ask people, you know, when it's relevant, uh, but, you know, these things are like, you know, the, the, the meme that goes around, hide, hide and go seek world champion. Uh, you you right. can't find them, but there are times that they allow themselves to be seen. Uh, you know, sometimes you do stumble across these things and you catch them off guard, but there are times that they literally allow you to, to see them. Uh, and then in your case, if this was a Bigfoot, follow you home, never to do anything, never to come back, but it certainly let its presence be known to you, at least that it was there. Right. I, I truly don't know. I, I have wondered that myself, especially, you know, my parents still live there to this day. And, um, I asked my dad and my mom the other day, have you ever had any weird experiences and, you know, anything like that? And, you know, my dad believes in Bigfoot, but he said, I've never seen one. Um, and you know, honestly, Tony, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. It's you know, uh, you said that your dad believes in Bigfoot. Do you know why your dad believes in Bigfoot? Is it like a cultural thing out there on the West Coast where it's like you know it, it, it's so ingrained in the culture that some people just grow grow up believing that they these things exist? Or you know, did somebody tell him their personal story? Did he ever tell you why he believes? 
Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, he said he's had friends that have told them their stories. Um, he, he's never divulged them to me. Um, but my dad loves the woods and anytime he can go out in it, I mean, they live in it, but you know, and he said that there's just so such a vast area of woodland that, you know, it's, kind of arrogant for us to think that we've found everything. Um, so um, I can remember uh, when I was younger going through a box of my dad's stuff um, from when he was younger and he had these old Bigfoot books, um, pictures and stories. Um, I think it was from maybe the seventies or eighties. I mean, they were fairly older books. Um, so I think it's something he's always been interested in. And he actually told me, he said, I've always wanted to see one and I've been disappointed that I haven't seen one yet, but I do believe that they're there. (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I know there's just, there's a lot of different reasons why people believe. I mean, certainly even me, I've never seen anything for me. It's just, I've heard so many stories that I believe in Bigfoot, you know, (laughs) and I believed in Bigfoot before I started this show. It was just I, I listened to a lot of people's personal encounters. I was fascinated by a topic. And at some point I crossed over that threshold into believing they exist. And then, you know, once I started the show and talked to people about their experiences, I was like, now I really believe they, <laughs> they exist. <laughs> and so, right. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, and everybody has their own threshold of belief uh, to begin with. Some people are much easier to believe in things than others. That's why there are people out there that, you know, uh, don't believe in any of this kind of stuff that we talk about on the show because they they are a different type of person that, you know, needs certain things to happen for them to cross over that threshold of belief. And then there's some people right. that, you know, you can just say, Hey, yesterday the sun came down out of the sky, landed in my backyard. I walked up to it, pet it, gave it a kiss, and went back into the sky. <laughs> and somebody's going to believe the story, you know? So, right. <laughs> I mean, right. it's just, uh, it, it is what it is. But I, I find it very interesting. I'm glad you shared that and stuff. Um, I, I know that it maybe was a little bit of a segue from some of the other things that we were talking right. about, but right. uh, <laughs> timeline wise, it fit. Because uh, I. Yeah. As you were a kid, you experienced these paranormal things in your house, which uh, are terrifying, uh, especially for a kid to go through, not to mention um, anybody else. Uh, and then you have this Bigfoot experience. And I know you had other experiences as an adult that we can get into right now. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to ask you uh, your own personal opinion and thought. Do you think this possible Bigfoot experience that you had is any way related to the paranormal type stuff that was going on at your house? I don't know. I, I've thought about that too. Um, I, I tend to believe that the Bigfoot might be related to the Nephilim in some ways. Um, you're my kind of people. And I know, (laughs) (laughs) and I know that they're, uh, you know, the Nephilim obviously I don't know if they're technically a spiritual being, but, you know, they come from the spiritual beings, the, uh, uh, you know, the fallen ones, yeah. all that. Um, but I don't know. I've thought about that. And I've heard some people's theories that Bigfoot is more paranormal than physical. Um, but, you know, I just... I don't know yet, Tony. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Uh, there are a lot of things that when I first started the show, I think I said, I don't know a whole lot. And uh, as I started <laughs> hearing more and more people's stories, it allowed me to, to uh, venture into uh, what, you know, start drawing some personal conclusions. Not that it's factual. Anything that I say on this show doesn't mean it's true. Uh, if I say I believe it doesn't mean it's true. It just means that that's kind of way, way I lean. I don't think I would ever say 100% I believe that Bigfoot are remnant of some kind of Nephilim type uh, origins, but uh, that's where I lean. But to say that that's what it is 100%, no way. Just like I would never say that it's just an animal walking around the woods that we haven't caught. Just like I wouldn't say that it's an alien from outer space. I don't know. But what we're here to do is theorize and think together. And that's what we do. And uh, people seem to enjoy going through that process with us. So um, 
Why don't we move into your adult life? And I don't want to skip anything. Uh, so why don't you start us off? Now that you're an adult, you've had other experiences. I do want to get into a side thing. Uh, I don't know if it's a side thing or not, but I know you had an incident with your ex-husband. And in the email you said, but that's a different story. I'm like, nope, we're going to get into it if you want to get into it. So uh, I just... Uh, a fair warning. We can I would like, get into that, yeah. Yeah, a fair warning. I'd like <laughs> to get into that if it's if it's possible, but I'll let you kind of take it away. Now that you're an adult, what happens? Okay, so um, I moved out of my parents' house, um, and I moved in with a friend of her parents, and I was really excited to get out of there, not realizing um, that things can follow people. And... Um, I remember it was the first night um, I was sharing a room with my friend and I go to sleep and I wake up again, paralyzed in fear. And I look at the foot of the bed and I see that shadow figure again. And in my mind, um, I hear it tell me, you can't get rid of me that easy. And at that point, it it turns into this big black wolf with red eyes, and it leaps at me. And, um, you know, I, I get up and I start screaming, and my poor friend <laughs> scared the crap out of her, too. And um, and then I realized, okay, this is, this is going to be, you know, I can't just move, and this is going to be over. Um, so shortly after that, I uh, went and I got my own place, um, and I met my ex-husband. I oh. want, I want, I, I'm going to interject again because I'm going to forget, and we need to make sure we hit on this. You're saying that this thing, if I heard you right, turned into a black wolf with red eyes and leaped at you. Yes. Yeah. And where was it again? It was on the wall? At the foot of the bed. At the foot of the bed. Now, yeah, and it, it was a large king size bed. Okay, so it leaps at you, and you're married at this time, right? Or you weren't? No, not not at this time. No. Okay, so it it leaps at you, and and what happens? And right before it gets to me, it like disappears. Okay, so you never um, you never felt anything physical, right? Not with this experience, no. Okay, so. I just want to tell you this, um, and I know I've said it maybe once or twice on the show, but you know we have a lot of new listeners, so I'll retell the story. Um, I was listening to another program, and a caller called in to share a story that he had where he was in his bedroom with his wife. They had a, a bad night. They were arguing a lot. They're laying in bed, and they're mad at each other. I don't think either one was sleeping, and he starts seeing these shapes appearing at the bottom of the bed, these different color shapes. I think he, I think he did say they were red shapes, but they start, he starts seeing these and he nudged her and he asked, do you see this? And she said, yes, I, I, I see this. And something inside of him told him that he should look to his left. And when he looked to his left, he saw a four legged dog standing in the middle of his room, absolutely huge, bigger than a wolf with red eyes. And oh wow. And I've heard this type of thing several times where people say a dog appears in their house with red eyes. And it reminds me a lot of the the Anubis. It reminds me a lot of the dog man. It reminds me a lot of this this idea that a demonic dog appears. And so I just wanted to kind of branch off into that and just let you know that I've heard that before, you know? So <laughs> You know, it's hard when you have these experiences, you know, it's hard to talk to people about it. You know, a lot of people think that you're crazy or, you know, you're just making it up. Um, and that's why I've never really told my story to people, you know, outside of my close circle, because, you know, it's, it's hard when people don't believe you. You know, these are things that truly happen to you. And uh, it's, it's sad, but it's kind of nice to know other people have experienced that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, if I experienced that, I would have a really hard time telling people um, unless I knew other people had experienced that. And that's why I yeah. kind of interjected and stuff because, you know, 
I like I said in the beginning before we even start recording, you know, I, I I want you to talk as much as possible, but sometimes I just I had to interject there because I could tell the way you were telling the story. I was like, I don't want her thinking she's alone in this, <laughs> and I didn't want to forget. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, Thank you told you. that story. I interjected you. The audience is having enough of me talking, so go ahead and take it away. <laughs> Okay, so um, I move out and I get my own apartment, and I'm working two jobs, so I really don't have much time to be at home and sleep, <laughs> so uh, the experience has really died off, um, and I meet my ex-husband, and I move in with him, and, you know, I I tell him about these experiences, because at this time, they're gone, but they're not a hundred percent gone. I could always feel this thing in the background, if that makes sense. And, um, and I could tell he didn't believe me. He is just very patronizing. Oh, okay. Yeah. You see ghosts. Okay. Um, and, but I just wanted to give him a fair warning. (laughs) Um, so I think we'd been, we hadn't quite gotten married yet. Um, we'd been together a little over a year at this time. And we lived in this apartment complex and, um, I kept having these really bad nightmares, um, that you just vivid dreams that I knew were demonically influenced. Um, I don't remember any of them at this point, but you know, I would, he would wake me up cause I'd be thrashing and, you know, yelling out in my dreams or whatever. And, um, my ex-husband was very, very much into uh, home defense, I guess is a good way to put it. He had a gun collection and a knife collection. And, you know, every night before we go to bed, he'd lock all the doors and make sure all the windows were locked. And he always slept with the bedroom door shut and locked, period. And um, I remember we're in bed and... I go to sleep and I slept against the wall and he slept against, um, on the side of the bed that was close to the door. And, um, I remember waking up and I just felt like I was suffocating and I couldn't really move. Um, and I can't remember if I could only move my head or if I could just move my eyes, but I remember looking down the, uh, towards the bedroom door because I could just feel this evil presence getting closer and closer, like it was coming down the hall. And um, the next thing I know, I see the bedroom door open, and there's these two figures standing there. And one enters the room, and then the other one does. And the second one that enters the room, as soon as it walks through the door. It drops down onto all fours. And this is a very, they're, they look like humans, but uh, the second one was very tall and lanky with very skinny arms and legs, but very defined and thick joints, if that makes any sense. Um, and I remember that one being like a tan color, not quite skin color, a little more yellow than skin color. Um, and it drops down on all fours and it crawls like a spider, uh, across the room and it comes along, um, the foot of the bed and, and I can't move and I can't scream and I'm just absolutely terrified. And I feel it, and I can see it start crawling up the foot of the bed on top of me. And it gets on top of me, and I can feel its weight pushing me down into the bed. And it had a a round head, a little more round than a normal person. Um, I don't remember seeing any hair, but it had large yellow eyes and it looked down at me and it smiled this huge smile from ear to ear and I just remember seeing hundreds of pointy little jagged teeth 
And I remember feeling its hot breath on my face. And this other figure is just standing by the side of the bed watching. Like he's got his arms crossed and is just standing there leisurely watching. It's like he's giving this thing permission to do this to me is kind of how I, the feeling that I got. And I remember the creature that's on top of me picks, brings up his left hand and he has very long spindly fingers again with the very large defined joints and he kind of wiggles his fingers in my face and he says um we're here to take your soul and i remember he took his hand starting with his first finger and he started pushing it into the center of my chest and it was a very cold painful feeling um, that I'd never ever experienced before and slowly he pushed his whole hand down into my chest and he's got this huge smile on his face the whole time it's, it's doing this and I can feel his fingers wiggling inside of my chest Tony and um I just remember feeling this cold pulling feeling like, like, like it was really taking my soul. And, um, at this point I'm so scared. I can't even think. Um, and finally, um, and I can't speak. And, um, I, I remember just praying, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me in my mind. Um, and um, after, I don't know how long it went on for, um, but after saying Jesus, help me a couple of times, it just stopped. They both just disappeared. And I got up just screaming and crying and you know, I was so terrified I couldn't even breathe. Um, and of course my ex-husband wakes up and he's all, what's going on? What's going on? And he's all, Oh, you're just having another one of your nightmares. And you know, you're just being over dramatic about a, a bad dream. Um, and then there's a knock on the door. Um, and our, the guy that lived in the apartment next to us, um, was a cop. (laughs) And I remember my ex-husband answered the door. When he came to get me, he said, the neighbor's here. He wants to make sure you're still alive. <laughs> um, and the the poor guy, he was out there in his boxers with his police issue gun. He's like, okay, I just wanted to make sure you were okay because you, you, know, you were screaming pretty bad. Um, and so I just, I remember sitting on the couch and I'm still crying because I never... It was scary. I had never experienced such fear in my life before. Um, and I I wanted it to be a dream. I wanted, you know, I wanted it to not have happened. And I'm trying to explain what's going on to my husband. And um, and he, he, I could tell he didn't believe me. And I said, well, you know what? If this didn't really happen why was the bedroom door open? And I remember he just kind of looked at me and he got a little pale and he's like, okay, okay, fine. Um, and, uh, so shortly after that, we got married. Um, and this is the, uh, the other long story. <laughs> um, so before we got married, he told me that he had um, bipolar. Um, and being young and naive, I didn't understand that there was severe forms of bipolar. Um, I thought it was just, oh, you have mood swings. Okay. And um, and he didn't divulge any different to me either. Um, so we get married and... Uh, The day we get back from our honeymoon, I had gone to have lunch with a girlfriend. 
And he was just acting a little funny, a little on edge, a little paranoid. Um, and I didn't think anything of it. I thought, well, it's just the stress of the wedding and everything. And, you know, so I get home and, um, my mom is there, which, you know, she had stopped by cause we, you know, we'd gone for a week <laughs> and she wanted to see me. And, um, I remember walking in the apartment and he's just very on edge, ranting and raving of, I don't even remember about what now, but he'd shaved his head and he said he'd join the military. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that would have been nice to know to have this conversation with your new wife. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he told my mom to leave and my mom just thought the whole situation was very strange. Um, so as soon as my mom left, he took my cell phone and, um, he told me that he was going to keep my cell phone for, you know, for the rest of the day and he was going to let me call anybody. And I'm like, what's going on here? And then he proceeds to bring out his whole uh, gun and knife collection. And, you know, he had AK-47, an SKS with a bayonet, you know, 9 millimeter. He had a 40 millimeter. I mean, just pretty much every single gun you could imagine he had. And hunting knives, machetes, you know, he had a very large collection. And um, he starts cleaning all of his guns and loading them. And he's ranting and raving about the government's coming to get us and just all these crazy things. And he keeps saying, if the cops come, I'm going to kill him. You know, if the cops come, I'm going to kill him. And I have no idea where any of this is coming from. And um, I know I told him at one point, I said, okay, give me my phone. Because I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to call my mom. Like, (laughs) you know, I'm going to call somebody, his mom, something. And, um, he again refused. He actually hid my cell phone from me. Um, and he actually at one point had stripped down completely naked. It was ranting through the house. Um, just total, just total craziness. Um, and his father had passed away about five years prior to us getting married. He was older than I was. Um, and I remember he brought out his dad's ashes and uh, they were in a little box and he pours two shot glasses of whiskey and then he takes his dad's ashes and he puts the ashes in both of the shot glasses and he told me to take a shot and I said I'm not going to do that I'm not <laughs> I'm not going to drink your father's ashes like that's that's cannibalism. That's like, I don't even know that. <laughs> it's wrong. Um, yeah. And then he, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, he took his nine millimeter and he put it to my forehead and he said, you're going to drink it. And so I did. Um, and at that point he said, we're going to go on a little drive. So we go in the car or in his truck. And he's got his AK-47. He's got a little twenty-two pistol. He's got his 9mm. I mean, he's got everything. And he's got a bunch of knives. And, you know, through this whole... And this is the condensed version. (laughs) Um, And through this whole thing, he keeps saying, you know, if the cops show up, I'm going to kill the cops. Or if your mom and dad show up, I'm going to kill your mom and dad. Or your sisters. Or whatever. You know, it's just... um, it was very intense and he has me drive out to this area uh, where out in the woods where we used to go target shooting. And I knew that's where he was having me go. And this is a very isolated area, very, very isolated area. Um, and we start going up the hill, we get off the freeway, we start going up the hill and Um, I asked him, I said, you know, where, even though I knew where we were going, because he was giving me directions, you know, turn here, turn there. Um, even though I knew where we were going, I asked him, I said, you know, where are you taking me? Where are we going? And he said, I'm going to take you back to the place where it all began. 
And I wasn't sure what that meant, but it terrified me. It absolutely terrified me. And um, so I just, you know, I just started praying. I'm like, okay, God, I don't know what to do. And, you know, my brand new husband has gone crazy (laughs) and he's got these guns and he's threatening to kill all these people. And I'm out in the middle of the woods and I don't know what to do, but, (laughs) you know, just give me some guidance here. And, um, I just heard this little voice in the back of my head to, you know, run, you need to run. And I was driving the truck at that time. Um, so I waited for an opportune moment where he was looking out the window and I threw the truck in the park and I bailed out of the truck and I start running down the hill. And, um, I knew we weren't very far from the freeway. So I was just thinking if I can get to the, or the highway, if I can just get to the highway, maybe I can flag somebody down and I can get some help. But then I was afraid because he's got all these guns and he's always been saying this whole time, you know, if the cops show up or if someone shows up, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to kill them. And, um, so, uh, I start running. And at the time I had very long hair. I had long hair all the way down to my butt. And, um, I had it in a ponytail that day and, um, I'm running through the woods and I can hear him behind me and I can see the highway and I can see the cars going by on the highway through the trees. And I'm like, okay, I'm almost there. And it's kind of like just in a movie in slow motion. I'm just about to break through the trees to reach the highway and he grabs the hair and he wraps it around his wrist, his fist and he drags me back up the hill to, to the truck and he throws me into the truck and um, he takes his 45 and he puts it, he cocks it and um, he puts it to my forehead and he said, if you ever try to do something like that again, I'm going to effing kill you. And um, at that point, I think he got in the driver's seat and he turned the truck around. Um, And I think by me doing that, he realized that he couldn't control the situation. Like I could get away and hide from him potentially. Um, And maybe, uh, you know, he, he was very, he was a very controlling person. (laughs) So he did not like to lose control. So I think that situation you know, made us, made him want to head back into town. Um, and as we're going back into town, he stopped by one of his friend's house and his wife was, uh, eight months pregnant at the time. And on the way to his friend's house, he keeps telling me, you better keep your mouth shut. You better not say anything or I'm going to kill her. And I'm going to cut the baby out of her belly and I'm going to make him watch before I kill her or before I kill him. And so we go to his friend's house and I'm visibly upset. Like, I don't know what is going on. I just had a gun put in my face twice in one day. And I don't know if my husband is going to kill me or if he's going to kill somebody else. And, um, so we're there and, um, you know, my ex-husband, he's pacing and he's just ranting and raving. And his friend is like, dude, what's going on? What's wrong with you? Um, and every time my ex-husband had his back turned, you know, I, I would mouth to his friend, like, help me, I need help, call the cops, call 911. And we were there for maybe, maybe 10 minutes. And finally he said, dude, you got to go. I don't know what's going on with you, but, you know, my wife's in the house, you got to go. And I was really hoping that he would call the cops or something, you know, um, but this guy grew weed on his property. (laughs) And at the time it was illegal (laughs) in the state. So, um, I, I think he didn't call the cops because he didn't want to be involved because, you know, he had his weed and that was more important, I guess. Um, so this, this was a whole like eight hour ordeal. Um, so we go home and, um, We were home for maybe 10 minutes and there was a knock on the door and, um, I just remember thinking, oh no, oh no, 
because if this is the cops and through, through the day, he's just getting more and more wound up more and more crazy, I guess you could say, and more aggressive, you know, grabbing me and shoving me around. And, um, and, uh, I go, I look at him like, what do you want me to do? And he said, I answer the door. So he grabs his AK 47 that I know is loaded and he goes to stand behind the door and he, um, and he has me open the door and it's a cop standing there and the cop asked, so are you, uh, Wendy? And I said, yes. Um, and he said, well, um, we're looking for, uh, you know, is, is Micah there? I said, yeah, he, he's here too. He says, oh, well, we would like to talk to him. I said, well, <laughs> I don't think he wants to talk to you right now. And he said, well, no, we really need to talk to him because we need to make sure you guys are both okay. Um, and the cop said, why don't you step out on the front, you know, out on the front porch um, and we can talk. And at that point, um, my ex-husband had tried to shut the door um, and the cop had his foot uh, in the door. So I back away. And there's my ex-husband there fighting with the cop, you know, trying to shut the door. And finally, the cop was able to get in. Um, and then they start wrestling over the gun. And I'm just absolutely terrified because I know that gun is loaded. And um, thankfully, the cop was able, able to overpower him. Um, and... Uh, they ended up taking him to the hospital, um, and he was in the uh, mental health unit for almost two months after that. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know to this day if I hadn't have run, um, if I would, you know, if he would have killed me or not. Uh, I would like to think he wouldn't have, but. Um, I I don't know another reason why we would go out there at that time. Um, but needless to say, shortly after that, um, you know, I essentially nursed him back to health. <laughs> um, and I tried to make our marriage work. We went to marriage counseling and um, it just wasn't something that I wanted to live with for the rest of my life. Cause I, I, I took all of the knives out of the house. I literally had <laughs> one paring knife that I would use to, to cut, you know, to cook, cook with. Um, Cause I was afraid of waking up one day and having a big kitchen knife to my throat or, you know, um, so that was, that was that experience. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, yeah. holy crap. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Like, that's well, crazy. It, yeah. And, you know, I was young and I, you know, we just got back from our honeymoon. Like, <laughs> yeah. what in the world is going on here? You, you would never <laughs> think. I mean, be happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're supposed to be happy, loving each other, dreaming about your lives together for the next however many years. Like, that's not a time to be to be going bananas like that. I mean, that, right. Wow. I, I can't. Yeah. I'm speechless. I, I'm truly, I don't, <laughs> what do you say to that? You, my right. God, I'm just glad you're alive. Like, thank you. you I am too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you really, I mean, one wrong move and who knows what could have happened. And that's just, holy cow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. See, life is, life is a journey <laughs> and it has its ups and downs <laughs> and, and, and people just, everybody's life story is different and everybody has certain points in their lives that it's just a dramatic point in their life personally. And, um, I'm convinced that we can learn so much from people's stories in life. And, and even when it's not paranormal necessarily, but just such a dramatic experience, um, maybe that would give what you just shared, maybe it would give uh, some other ladies, you know, confidence to try to get out of a situation that they're in right now. Um, 
unfortunately, there's a lot of cowards in this world that, you know, batter women. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't understand because I'm not in your shoes as a woman. I don't understand what it's like to be in a position where you truly feel helpless. You don't know what to do. And you just feel like one wrong step and the person that's supposed to love you uh, could take your life. I mean, that yeah. that feeling, I, I, I try to sit here like while you're t- telling your story, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and, and understand how you were feeling. But I, I don't think I could ever truly understand it because I'm never in that situation, you know? <laughs> and it's just, yeah, wow. Yeah, it was, it was definitely life changing. Um, it, I, I feel, uh, for a while and even to this day, sometimes, um, you know, I have PTSD episodes from it. Um, but I, when, after it first happened, I really withdrew into myself. Like I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to do anything. Um, and finally, I, you know, because I was scared, I was afraid, well, if my husband can do this, what about the stranger walking down yeah. the street, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I just decided that I wasn't going to live my life in fear. Um, and, you know, that, that took a little bit to start applying into my life. Like you, my, my friends would call, Hey, let's go out and do something. And my initial response is, oh, no, no, no. I think I'll just stay in and watch a movie or whatever. And it's like I had to start making that conscious effort to go out and do more, you know. Um, And it wasn't easy. But, um, you know, I do feel that when life gives you situations, you, you know, they're not pleasant all of the time. But you, you learn from them and you grow from them. So... Well, I, I do want to thank you before we go any further for sharing that. I, well, going into it, had no idea it was going to be that dramatic. And um, <laughs> and if I if I put you on the spot, I, I apologize for that. And uh, I, no, I, that's okay. I just, man, I, I I just can't say thank you enough for sharing that. And I and mostly because, like, I think what you just did is empower women who are in a situation like that to try to get out of it and know that it, they don't have to live with it like that and they don't have to stay in that situation. And so um, I, I think you sharing that story really did did good for people. Um, I hope so. Me, I, I truly I do. do. I really so. Yeah. Um, if you're in a situation like that, try to find a way out. I know. And and even with what your ex-husband did, he was manipulating you through other people. So he wasn't just threatening you, but he was threatening the people that you love. And he was also threatening people that maybe you didn't know too well, but he, he threatened people and played on your empathy for other people because he clearly lacked that. And so the idea of killing a pregnant woman and, and, and cutting a baby out of the womb, like that's just psychotic. And Yes. He put you in a situation where you probably would have chose death before allowing somebody to cut a baby out of a woman's womb. I and and I would have, yes. And and, and he knew that and that's why he did that. And so yeah. um there are there are people out there that are abused right now and they're in a similar situation where they're being manipulated to be controlled. And you don't need to sit in that. And you can try to find a way out. Um, I don't know everybody's situation, but I just feel like I needed to say that. So, wow, took a serious yeah. turn. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's it's this is real life stuff. I mean, we're we're yeah, we're a paranormal yeah. show. We dive into conspiracies and stuff, but this is a real life show. These are real people with real life experiences, and you just can't predict everything. So, uh, again, Wendy, I thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to, uh, yeah. we're, we're going to backtrack a little bit to before you guys were married. Um, you had okay. these black masses or whatever they were, um, opened the door, came in, one crawled over to you like a spider, crawled up on you, uh, told you it was going to take your soul, puts its hands down your throat, you feel it. Um, uh, that's terrifying. Uh, and, and yeah. again, we talked about it earlier and you said it was going to come up the smile with the jagged teeth, uh, 
it, it's a very common thing. You're not alone in that. Uh, and I, I just feel like I need to let you know that, that, that you're not the only person who has seen that. Um, we even had a guy come on the show, uh, episode 29, it's called Bedroom Visitations. David comes on the show and he talks about several different things. But one of the experiences he had was he was in bed with his wife one night and he wakes up because there was these, and he's in the intro of the show. There's the two great entities pulling him off the bed. But what isn't said in the intro is that not only did he feel like he was being pulled off the bed, but he also felt like there was something being pulled out of him. And when you talk about um, the idea of, of what they were saying, they're going to take your soul and they reached in like they were going to pull it out of you. Um, people say that there are three parts of the human body. There's the actual body, there's the spirit and the soul. There are three separate things that are contained in this house that we have as a human body. And so the idea of, I, I personally don't think that they had the authority to do that anyways. I think they were more or less torturing you in it. Um, I, I personally believe you can't even sell your soul to the devil, even though you think you did. If you if you're out there and you think you sold your soul to the devil, I don't believe that you actually truly did because I don't think your soul is owned by you to sell. I think it's owned by God, and so you can't sell something that you don't have ownership over. Um, God, if if God truly is the deciding factor of all for all our fates, you know, for eternity, then He holds that in his hands and he controls that. So I don't believe that your soul was truly going to be taken, but I think the threat was there and the manipulation. Yeah. Of and so, um, it, it's a very, it's a very interesting thing. Um, gosh, that's scary. Like you have a scary life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, if you don't yes. mind me asking you, uh, roughly, you don't have to give it an exact age, but how old are you? <laughs> I know. I'm 32. All right. You're 32. Okay. Uh, you're younger than me, young lady. So there you go. Um, <laughs> I know it's not polite to ask people these things, but I'm Tony and I no, say, Oh, that's okay. So, um, <laughs> so you're 32 years old and you've had these experiences in your life. Do you feel like this is going to be a lifelong thing for you? Um, when I talked to my mom about it, um, because there, there were some other experiences. Um, you know, I would smell things like men's cologne, super overpowering to where it'd give you a headache. Um, and then it would just disappear. Um, and, or a really pretty floral scent and it would just smell really great. And then it would just turn into the sickly sweet smell and then it would disappear. Um, and finally, um, I called my mom cause that had happened and I was alone in the house. This was before I got married. Um, and I called my mom. I'm like, mom, these things are going on. I'm alone and I'm scared and I don't have anyone to talk to. And she actually started crying and she said, she just kept saying, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, mom, why are you sorry? Like, <laughs> what do you have to be sorry for? And she said that, um, my, when she was young, I have, uh, my mom and I have two other aunts and my grandma that, um, all of the women on my mom's side of the family, um, experienced paranormal stuff. Um, and my mom never talked about it. She acknowledged that, you know, I mean, we grew up in a Christian home and she acknowledged that you know, there's angels and there's demons and there's good, there's evil. Um, but she never really expounded past that. Like, oh, yes, I've had experiences, but I'm not going to talk about it because that brings them, you know, that that brings them to you, um, which is another reason why I've never really, you know, talked about it. Um but she said when she was younger that she would have similar experiences, not to the extent that I explained to her, um, you know, which is basically what I told you, um, but the same smells, the same like heavy men's cologne or the sweet smell that goes to uh, really bitter, um, sickly sweet. Um, and she said that whatever it is, there's something in our family that affects all the women in it. And with my mom and my aunts, um, 
their paranormal experiences stopped when they were in their late teens, early 20s. Excuse me. And with my grandma, I know my grandma, she experienced uh, paranormal stuff almost up until the day she died. Um, and um, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, I think it, I don't know if it's passed down in our family line or if there's a generational curse. Um, but me being 32 and I'm still having experiences up to this day. Um, I, I don't know. I, I tend to lean towards, um, it might be something I'll deal with for my whole life. And, um, now that I have a daughter, um, you know, actually I almost canceled, um, this interview, uh, cause a couple of days after I inter- uh, sent my email to you, my daughter, who's five, um, she started waking up in the middle of the night screaming. And she said um, that she was seeing werewolves come out of her closet. And we're very protective over our children. Um, you know, we make sure that what they watch on TV is appropriate. <laughs> you know, she. I don't even know necessarily if she would know exactly what a werewolf is. I'm sure she has friends, you know, and cousins, older cousins. But, um, uh, and she started experiencing things. And I could tell it wasn't just a five-year-old's imagination. Um, she was waking up legitimately terrified. And when I would ask her, you know, what's going on? Mommy, there's werewolves that come out of my closet. Um, And I know one night um, I've been going up and laying down with her uh, so she could go to sleep at night. And she's been refusing to let us turn the bedroom light out. Um, And we go up there and we read her little children's Bible and pray with her. Um, And I went to go close the bedroom, the closet door, thinking that might help. And she started, she started freaking out. She said, no, don't close it. I said, why, baby? Well, I want, if something's in there, I want to be able to see it. Like, (laughs) when I was young, I wanted my closet door shut. Because if something was in there, I didn't want to see it, (laughs) you know? But I think her, for her, the idea of the closet door opening or not being able to see, you know, what's in the closet was more scary for her. Um, is how I took that. Um, but I guess I made the correlation in my mind between emailing you and, you know, these things popping up all of a sudden. Um, but I decided, you know, I, I just felt like I needed to tell my story. Um, and if this is something that my daughter is going to have to deal with, then, you know, I, you know, I guess I'll just be right there for her. And it's, and it's kind of hard because I was always upset with my mom and my parents when I would go to them, you know, Hey, I'm seeing these things. And I felt like they were brushing it off. Like, Oh, well, maybe it was just a a shadow or the moonlight or, you know, uh, whatever. Um, and now being a parent, like, yeah, what do you say? Yep, yeah, baby, that was a demon in your room. Yep, you saw a demon. <laughs> you, you know, how do you handle that? Because <laughs> yeah. you want to be honest with them, but you don't want to scare them more either, you know? So, yeah. I think knowing your child, uh, I think all kids are different. And so you you got to pay attention to who your child is and know how much your child can handle as far as, um, information goes. But I think as your child matures and gets older and, um, is more intelligent, you know, just through maturity, uh, I think being open and honest with your child is extremely important. Um, yeah, you, you can't fight a battle that you don't even know you're in. You're if you're in the middle exactly. of a war and you have, and you're and you have no clue, then like, that's dangerous. And it's not healthy for anybody to be in the middle of a battlefield and not even know you're in the middle of a war. And so I think it's very important. I know a lot of times 
People tend to try sheltering their kids from these experiences that they went through and hope that it doesn't happen to their kids. But if you start seeing things that are happening through your children that you experienced, instead of running away from it, instead of ignoring it, hoping it goes away, well, it didn't go away for you. So right. take it on head on because as the parent, you're the authority in that house. And just like anybody else, you would never let somebody come in your house and smack your kid around. You, you, you murder the guy. You know, and so right. <laughs> you, you don't you don't let things on a spiritual level do that either. And so I, I think um, it's very important to change the course of action in your family's history uh, with you being maybe more open and honest with your your children uh, so that they don't go into situations blindly. And um, it does sound like a generational curse. It. it absolutely does to me. Um, it sounds like there's somebody in your history of your family that may either maybe did something really crazy or was involved in some crazy stuff or something happened to them that kind of pushed the family into a certain line. I don't believe it can't be undone, but I think the first step is to figure out what that is. And so um, you might need to do some digging and see if you can turn up any information. Well, I've it told in the past that, um, you know, in my mother's lineage, there was a uh, very famous voodoo witch um, in New Orleans. Um, and that is where my mother's side of the family comes from. So I haven't had a chance to look that up to see if that's true. Because you know how sometimes families are, oh, yeah, we've got blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it, <clears throat> and it's not really, you know, it's true. It's just family lore. But um, I think especially now with my daughter experiencing things, um, that's definitely something I'm going to look into. Um, because if that's the case, I don't know how to fix that, but I'll find a way. <laughs> I'll find a way. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, share the show with your friends because that is the best thing you can do to help the show grow. Just share it, share it, share it. And if you're looking for more shows to listen to, we have launched Hammer Lane Legends. It's another podcast that me and my dad are hosting where we talk to truckers and people who drive for a living and they share their wild, crazy experiences from the road. And yesterday we dropped episode number six and we titled it Locomotive Fueler Encounters UFO. We have Rob coming on the show and he shares a lot of different experiences as a trucker, but one of the things that he experienced when he was fueling locomotives with his tanker, he had an up and close encounter with a UFO. And it's not the only time it happened to him. And the second time he had witnesses. And so if you want to check that out, go to hammerlanelegends.com, hit play or find it on your favorite podcast app today. And until next week, friends, stay safe, take care. And remember, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.